لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد نقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أفلا يتدبرون القرآن أم على قلوب أقفالها رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين In the very beginning of this khutbah I'd like to make uh, two admissions, two disclaimers The first of them is that the subject matter that I've chosen after a long you know, long time thinking about it is rather difficult. But I think it's important enough that even though I typically when I choose a topic for a khutbah, I try to make it as simple as I can. But I think this matter is important enough and critical enough for all Muslims that I try to address it. So I pray Allah gives me clarity in speech and clarity in thought that I'm able to convey something to you of benefit. The second thing I'm reminded as soon as I entered and I saw our Imam sitting here, of the famous expression of the Arabic language, Aghna sabah anil misbah. When the morning is there, you don't need a lamp. So if the Imam is here, I don't even know why I was invited to give a khutbah. But inshallah ta'ala, now that I'm in this position, I pray that I can give it some justice. So in this brief khutbah, I want to talk to you about two dimensions of our relationship with the Quran. Allah Azza wa has described our relationship with the Qur'an in many ways. It's not one kind of relationship or many relationships we have with the Qur'an. For instance, it is a reminder for us and it is a means by which we remind each other. So it is a dhikr that is for ourselves and also we, bil Qur'an, we remind others by means of the Qur'an. It is something we have to think about. We're constantly called upon to think about the Qur'an, to listen to it carefully, to reflect upon it. And when it comes to reflection specifically, which is the dimension a little bit I want to highlight today, as I started with the ayah of Surah Muhammad, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ Allah asks the question, why don't they think deeply about the Qur'an? When it comes to the Qur'an, why don't they engage in deep thought? Why don't they engage in deep reflection? The word tadabbur comes from dubur, which means behind, the, the behind of something, the back of something. And tadabbur means you hear something, and when you hear something, there's the surface of it. And you have to really engage in thought to understand what are the implications and the consequences that are behind the statement that's being made. What is behind it? So in other words, there is depth in the words, and you have to dive in to understand. A visual example would be that of the ocean. You're looking at the surface of the ocean, and you can see the ocean, but you have to appreciate that there's something going on underneath. And there, there are a lot of treasures and a lot of depth that lies that didn't meet the eye. Just because you saw the surface, you don't know everything there is to know about the ocean. It's going to require some effort and some exploration before you can figure out what's really, what, what really lies in the depths of this ocean. Now having said that, Allah Azza wa Jal, when He talks about reflection in the Qur'an, interestingly enough, he makes the same statement almost identically twice. He says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran." Why don't they reflect? Or don't they reflect deeply into the Qur'an? But one time, when he talked about this problem that people don't reflect, he actually made it a problem of the heart. So he said, أَمْ عَلَى قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Or is it the case that their hearts have their own locks placed on them? The hearts are locked up. The hearts, you know, the hearts having a problem is described in different ways in the Qur'an. It is a spiritual problem, I think every one of you can understand that. When people don't do the dhikr of Allah, they don't remember Allah, they don't have the fear of Allah in their hearts, the love of Allah in their hearts, the remembrance of Allah in their hearts, then the hearts start getting locked up. When the hearts, when the people's eyes and their ears are listening to all the things that distract them from the remembrance of Allah, then the hearts start becoming hard, and they start getting locked up. So Allah is saying, you are so distracted by so many other things, that your heart is not interested anymore in spending time reflecting on the Qur'an and internalizing the Qur'an. This is a spiritual problem that Allah highlights in Surah Muhammad. Yet in another case in the Qur'an, Allah Azza wa Jal says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا This is the only other time Allah makes the same statement. And He says subhanahu wa ta'ala, that what, don't they reflect on the Qur'an? Had it been from someone other than Allah, they would have found a lot of contradiction, inner conflict within the Qur'an. The Qur'an, one part of it would have contradicted another part of it. Now the idea of finding consistency 
when things are consistent with each other and when things contradict each other this is not a spiritual exercise this is an intellectual exercise when you study a book and you say chapter 5 is contradicting chapter 3 or you're saying this page is contradicting that page or this formula contradicts that formula or this scientific conclusion contradicts that scientific conclusion when you're looking for these kinds of consistencies or inconsistencies these correlations or these contradictions then what you're talking about is something that is intellectual not something that is spiritual what I'm trying to say is on the one hand Allah Azza wa is saying that the reflection or the lack of reflection into the Quran is a spiritual problem and on the other hand, he's saying that the lack of reflection into the Qur'an, had you truly reflected, you would have become convinced that there are no contradictions, and therefore this cannot be the word of a human being. This can only be the word of Allah, and you would have been intellectually convinced. You would have reached that conclusion with your minds. And so this interesting phenomenon in the book of Allah Azza wa Jal, that sometimes he talks about the heart, and sometimes he talks about the mind. Sometimes he talks about al-qalb, and talks, sometimes he talks about al-aql al-aql and it's interesting that both of those have a lot of interplay in the Qur'an just a couple of examples even though there are literally dozens upon dozens of examples of this phenomenon in the Qur'an that I want to share something with you about inshallah ta'ala hopefully this argument builds in a consistent way in a logical way Allah Azza wa Jal talks about Banu Israel in Surah Al-Baqarah I think all of you know that he extensively talks about Banu Israel and the story of the cow itself that was slaughtered in order to discover who the killer is. فَقُلْ نَضْرِبُوهُ بِبَعْضِهَا كَذَلِكَ يُحْيِي اللَّهُ الْمَوْتَى وَيُرِيكُمْ آيَاتِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ So the, the Israelites were told to take this piece of flesh and to throw it onto the dead corpse and then the dead will rise and he will point to the actual killer. كَذَلِكَ يُحْيِي اللَّهُ الْمَوْتَى That is how Allah gives life to the dead. In other words, this miraculous story is being described. And then Allah says to the Israelites, He says to them, وَيُرِيكُمْ آيَاتِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ And He keeps on showing you His miraculous signs so that you could think. So that you could think, you could apply your aql. In the very next ayah, Allah says, ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ Your hearts became hard. Allah first said that you did, you refused to think. I gave you ayat so you could think. But since you didn't think, your hearts became hard. Allah did not say your minds became hard. He said your hearts became hard. SubhanAllah. The previous problem was one of, why don't you think? And then immediately after, there's a spiritual problem that rises. Similarly, you find in Surah Al-Hadid, Allah Azza wa Jal talks about the hearts, فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ Their hearts had become hard. Their hearts have become hard. Most of them are corrupt. Most people, it's talking about the people of the book. فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدْ فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ A long period has passed over them. They have, their, their deen that was so pure and so beautiful has been corrupted. It's been changed. All that is left is some empty ceremonies. That's all that's left. And so their hearts have become hard and most of them are corrupt. Most of them are not really truly interested in what their deen, what the revelation of Allah actually has to say. And in the very next ayah, Allah says, اعلموا أن الله يحيي الأرض بعد موتها قد بينا الآيات لقوم يعقلون Know that Allah gives life to the earth after it had died. And, Allah, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we clarify the ayat, so, so that you can think. So that you can think. The previous ayah was about the heart becoming hard, a spiritual problem. And then the next, listen to the ayat carefully so you can think. In other words, our spiritual diseases are not disconnected from our intellectual problems. When your mind becomes clear, when your mind becomes clear, when you can think clearly about this deen, then it will help you cleanse your heart. And when your heart is cleaner, then it will cleanse your thoughts. These are interrelated to each other. Which is why ulama that commented on the profound statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ Allah purifies the people. That the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would purify the people by reciting the Qur'an onto them, that they understood that this tazkiyah, this purification, is two parts. Allah will purify the way people think. And Allah will purify their hearts, their motives. He will remove the greed from their hearts. He will temper the, He will control or limit the temptations they have, the urges that they have, He'll put a check on them. But at the same time, He'll teach them how to think properly. I bring all of this up for a very particular reason. As I travel, 
and I travel, alhamdulillah, now not only in the United States but outside also, I'm noticing a consistent problem. We emphasize the education of Islam as Muslims. At least now there's at least some emphasis that we need to educate ourselves and our children about Islam. But the problem that we're having is that we're emphasizing the acquisition of information. We're emphasizing this idea that our children have to know certain du'as and certain surahs and they have to know how to read the Qur'an at least in Arabic they should, their tajweed should be good and all of these are important things none of these are unimportant but there is this emphasis on al-ilm, on knowledge but there, at the same time there is almost no emphasis on those two things on, one, on the one hand how do you cleanse the heart on the spiritual condition and on the other hand there is no emphasis on thought on thinking when you have a young man come up to me and say, how do I explain, or even a, a grown Muslim come up to me and say, how do we explain to our co-workers that we're fasting? How do we explain to them, because they're not Muslim, and we need to explain to them that we're fasting, and they think it's weird. So can you give me a good answer for them? Or how do I tell my co-worker that I'm making wudu? How do I explain that he walked into the bathroom, I was in the office, or I was on campus, and I was making wudu, and he saw me and he thought it was strange. Can you give me a good answer I can give them so I don't get embarrassed? Or when they see us making salah, they ask what kind of cardiovascular exercise are you doing? So could you explain to me what kind of yoga this is? So what can we tell them? What can we tell them? And you know in a lot of these kinds of questions, you're looking for an answer that can maybe help the other understand and you have good intention for those questions but let me tell you something our deen is such that we don't actually and, and here's one more I have to add to this young people come up to me and say you know all my friends are going to a Halloween party they're all going all my co-workers are going to a Christmas party how do, how do I tell them I can't go how do I explain to them that I don't take part in this stuff you know this question itself, you're seeking an answer, but you know what this question these questions tell me? These questions tell me we did not train ourselves how to think. We did not teach ourselves how to think, not according to this book. You see, if you know how to think, then when somebody says, let's go to the Halloween party, you actually turn around and say, what is Halloween? Why do you celebrate it? Before you ask me why I'm not going, what made you dress up like Cleopatra? And what made you dress up like, you know, Barney? and you're going out and knocking on strangers doors begging for food before you explain to me why we're going to do this highly logical exercise why don't you tell me why you do it before, you, before I explain to you why I don't do it in other words people that are doing ridiculous things are now asking us why we are not participating and now we feel like we need to explain ourselves that's because we're not clear in our thinking we need to understand, we need to see something that's false something that's ridiculous and be able to have the confidence and the clarity of thought to be able to say listen I'm not the one with the problem here I'm not the one with the problem here I'm actually the one turning back to my, the one who created me I'm the one that has uh, alhamdulillah by the grace of the creator by the grace of Allah at least he's blessed me enough to know that I have a purpose in this life that goes beyond dressing up like you know a monkey or whatever and going and collecting candy or getting drunk on, at the celebration of Jesus what a great way to celebrate Jesus' legacy, by the way. Right? Just get drunk at a party and curse your family members out. And we're the ones to blame? We're the ones that have to explain ourselves? You feel like you have to explain yourself? You don't have to be offensive to your coworkers, but at least you have to have the clarity of thought. Clarity of thought. And this is more important now than ever before. Because even though, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, as I travel, I, this becomes clearer and clearer to me. Even though you go to the, the countries where Muslims are the majority, Muslim countries, where the schools are teaching Islam, where our children are learning to recite the Qur'an, you know, where the, where the salawat, the masajid are still filled. Even there when you, young people ask questions, they ask questions about how, how are we so sure Islam is the right religion? I was watching this video and I got some questions I don't know how to answer. There are, some, there are some people who are claiming that there are contradictions in the Qur'an. There are some people who are claiming that the, the Rasulullah wasn't actually a prophet. And here's what they're saying. I don't know how to answer these questions. I do know how to make dua though. I know how to make dua, I memorize that. I know how to make salah, my wudu is pretty good. But I don't know how to defend my deen. Not when it comes to a couple of YouTube videos. This is a problem. We're emphasizing knowledge. But we're not emphasizing thinking. 
We, anybody can come with any kind of criticism and just post a YouTube video or create a blog or post something on Reddit and our young, our youth and even you know, grown adults read that stuff and it takes so little for them to be thrown off. So little that they can hear, read something or hear something and you know, the reality is they will hear something. The reality is they will, they will see something. You can't stop that from happening. They are going to receive and be exposed to attacks against this deen. Now more than ever before. They are accessible and they are constant. And there are far more attacks against Islam than there are efforts to promote the teachings of Islam. Far more attacks. So if we don't understand how to think and respond, then even though on the surface, on the outside, it will look like we're Muslim and we're praying and the masajid are fill, filled, but on the inside, the hearts and the minds are becoming empty of this, the clarity of this deen. This is critical. This is absolutely essential. What's happened in so many Muslim societies, and inshallah ta'ala this trend is reversing, but it's been going on for some decades now, that there are actually two classes of Muslims in many Muslim societies. There are a group of Muslims and entire villages, neighborhoods, entire families that decide that we will take our deen seriously, we are going to send our children to become hufad of Qur'an, and then ulama, and they're going to come back, and they're going to lead taraweeh, and they're going to give durus in the masajid, and we're going to preserve the teachings of this deen, and we're going to try to live by them as best we can. In Muslim countries, there are people like this, and communities like this. And on the other hand, there are people who say, these people that are so concerned with their religion, they don't even know what's going on in the real world. They don't even have a bachelor's degree. They don't even know what, you know, philosophy 101. They don't know anything. They don't know what you know, Richard Dawkins has to say, or you know, or, or you know, what, what the modern criticisms are, what agnosticism is, what you know, what scientific theory is. They don't know anything. So we're just gonna learn a little bit of religion, just because my parents want me to learn something, and they want me to pray and stuff. But I'm gonna go to college, get a real education, and stay away from those religious extremists. And this is happening in the Muslim world. There's an entire population of Muslims who want, they see a guy with a beard or they see a woman with a hijab and they go the other way. Like those people are crazy. They, they don't, I don't know what's going on in their head. They live in a different time. They live in a different century. The last thing they think now when they see a guy that kind of even looks religious a little bit or maybe a sister that seems to be observing her deen, they look at them and they think these people don't think for themselves. They're so unsophisticated. They're so backwards. And that population is growing. That population of people is growing. And those are Muslims too. SubhanAllah. This deen, that deen that, the deen that prides itself, it is the only exception to the statement that was made by Marx. The German statement he made that was translated, religion is the opiate of the masses. That religion is like a drug. It keeps people from thinking for themselves clearly. It, it's just a way of the church controlling people. It's true for the church, certainly. It's true for the church. They, they banned the reading of the Bible for all Christians. You know, the Roman Empire, when they established Christianity, or really Paulism, as their official religion, they banned the average Christian from reading the Bible. You couldn't even have a copy of it. The Pope will interpret it for you. You don't think for yourself. You don't ask any questions. Briefly concluding, this idea that religion keeps people from thinking clearly. There's no book, no sacred text, that you can read from one end to the other, that keeps complaining about the fact that people aren't thinking. For themselves. أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ فَهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ It didn't just emphasize the acquisition of knowledge. It keeps on emphasizing thinking, thinking, thinking. أَوَلَوْ كَانَ أَبَاؤُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَهْتَدُونَ Wasn't, Isn't it the case that their ancestors, they didn't understand anything. They didn't think for themselves. And they did not receive any guidance. They, didn't, they weren't committed to guidance. This is the one religion that made, made people think. And it is so tragic that now, overall, we are a people that assume that if you just know some things about this religion, you just know how to pray, you just know how to you know, make some mathkar, you don't need to think more about this deen. It will not make you think. Wallahi, this deen, if there's one thing this Qur'an will do for you, it will make you think. If there's one thing it will do for you. It does not thought, constant thinking about clarity, about purpose, about the remembrance of Allah, about justice, about fairness, about what is right and what is wrong. It cannot escape you. Allah Azza wa Jal did not let anything in your human experience go by without you making you think about it. Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ard, wa ikhtilafi layli wal nahar. The skies and the earth, the night and the day, the, the clouds, the ships that are sailing, all of anything you look at, ayat in liqawmin yaqilun. 
There, all of these are ayat for people who like to think. All of these became ayat. There's not an experience you have that you can't call an ayah. And the purpose of an ayah, so you can think. So I can think. We're supposed to be a very thoughtful nation. We're supposed to be engaged over here. And what that does is it reinforces the dhikr of Allah in our hearts. It reinforces the dhikr of Allah in our hearts. So long as we don't give this right of the word of Allah, we don't become a people that emphasize clear thinking. We, are, we might fall under the same trap that Allah described for Bani Israel, for Bani Israel and the Ahlul Kitab in general. وَلَا يَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ you know, uh, الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِ فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدْ فَقَصَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ Don't become like the people of the book who came before you. A long period passed over them. Please listen to this last comment carefully. It is, it is essential what Allah says in Surah Al-Hadid. He basically says when a nation comes, Allah sends a messenger and He gives a message and that message is fresh. And the first generation that takes that message, they properly understand it. And they live it according to its spirit. But a, a few generations later, only the, the rituals are left. Only the, uh, the surface of it is left. But the heart of that deen, the thought-provoking message itself, that used to cleanse people on the outside, but also cleanse them on the inside. That beautified society on the outside, but beautified the souls and the hearts and the minds of human beings on the inside. The inside of it just disappears. فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدْ So the only thing left at that point is where we are now. It's, it's a sta sad state where we are now. I still remember every year, you know, once in a while, every while, once in a while somebody sends me an email in Urdu or, you know, sends me a voicemail. Ibadat ki raat kaun si hai? Which is the night that we have to do some ibadah? A question tells me a lot. That's all the religion is reduced to for some people. It's all that's left. Why do you think we see more people at the Eid prayer than anything else? They come out, you look like they're all here? They're from Texas? Where do these people come from? You know where they come from? They come from the fact that the religion, our, our, our appreciation of this religion has deteriorated. And so for some people, it's just these little bits and pieces of deen that's left. That's all there is. That's all there is and there's nothing more. May Allah Azza wa make us a people of clear thought. And more importantly, may Allah Azza wa help us raise a generation that is thoughtful. That thinks about this deen clearly, it can stand up for its teachings and be able to deliver its message in a clear way to the rest of society. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyyakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.